Helena has a loving husband and two beautiful daughters, but there is a deadly secret she's never told them. It is the mystery of her past, who she really is, and where she's from. When Helena's father escapes prison and grabs the attention of national news, she is forced to expose herself and her family to the truth of her identity. She's the Marsh King's daughter. The book, The Marsh King's Daughter. The author, Karen Dion, and you're listening to Lit Society. Let's, Let's get, get lit! lit! Hey y'all, this is Kari. And this is Alexis. And you're listening to Lit Society, a show about books and drama. Alexis, I heard something's going around. People are getting the coughs. How are you doing over there by you? I've been hanging in there. I haven't caught anything just yet, so I'm pretty pleased with that. Very good, because we want you healthy. (laughs) And in harmony with that, let's continue to our theme of the week. Okay. (laughs) Listeners, listeners, you know, every week, uh, usually, we select a theme to discuss inspired by the book we're reading. This week, the theme I selected is how to stay alive and healthy if you're lost. Now, I'm not talking about getting lost in a neighborhood or on your way to the store. I mean, if you are hiking and at the mercy of the elements, how can you stay safe? Alexis, have you ever been lost? Um, No, not hiking lost. No. Yeah, not lost where you couldn't even get a phone signal. No, not like that. You really started to panic. That's beautiful. I've tasted a little bit of that, but I wasn't alone. And a lot of people like to hike because it disconnects you from all the noise that we have in our everyday lives. Some people like to do that alone. I think of a friend of ours who loves hiking alone. She one of them I-N-D-E-P <laughs> women. Okay. And it makes me nervous because even the best tracker can get lost. Wouldn't exactly. you agree? Yep, I agree. Every year, hikers lose their way and pay for it, unfortunately, with their lives. Uh, People who get lost in the wilderness often have everything that they need with them to survive. Some people call these the 10 essentials. They include things like a pocket knife, matches, lighter, map and compass, headlamp, sunglasses, sunscreen, raincoat, extra clothing, food, water, a purification system for water you may find in a stream, for example, and a first aid kit. Um, Nowadays, of course, we'll have our phone with us or some other GPS device, but it's easy to lose signal (laughs) when you're away from a city. So away from those towers. I remember reading Hatchet. Yeah, or or away from a tower. Girl, Mm -hmm. um, in some friends' apartments, you might not have a signal. (laughs) So do not rely on your cell phone to save you. (laughs) Exactly. Um, Did you ever read Hatchet? (laughs) No. As a kid? No, it doesn't sound familiar. Yeah, it's about a boy that like survives in the wilderness and it it doesn't make it sound easy, but it makes it sound doable. And I've always thought, you know, this is a fantasy. I If I ever get lost and I mean, turned around, I just need to lay down and just uh, realize my end is imminent. However, that is <laughs> that not has true. been my thing. If I get lost, yeah, I'm just going to lay down and take a nap and start all over later. Hey, hey however, you're on to something. We'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> because there are rules to follow, you guys, if you ever get lost. And I'm going to say hiking because that's an activity where a lot of us, a lot of us love to hike and a lot of us um, just love to be at one with the elements, yeah. uh, especially if you're going out alone. There are there's one acronym we want you to always remember, and it's oh. STOP, S-T-O-P. OK. What do you think the the S stands for in the acronym STOP. Stop. You got it. Girl, you smart. You went to school. I did. (laughs) That's right. A lot of schooling. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Stop like Alexis would. Mm -hmm. Sit down. Breathe from your belly. Eat and drink something. Not all of it, because we don't know how long you're going to be out there. But, you know, have a little (laughs) sip of something. Water, you guys. Yeah, not the tequila and wine you brought. (laughs) Tequila and wine? Y'all got a problem. (laughs) Mind your business. Listen, drink some water, eat some almonds if you don't have a nut allergy. And hopefully your brain will work out the situation after you've calmed down. You know, 
because you can start to freak out. No, mm-hmm. no, yep. no, calm down. You you might not even be lost like you think, but maybe right. you are. And that leads us to T, which is think. Ooh. Ask yourself basic questions. Which direction were you going in? Where's the sun setting? Is it behind you? Is it in front of you? Always try to know your cardinal directions. Right. Um, have you passed by any recognizable landmarks? Is there a mesa to the right of you that is very famous, has a famous name, and you've kept it to the right of you on your journey? Very smart. Then you may know your way. If so, how long was it ago that you passed that Mesa? I read that um, most hikers are only traveling about two miles per hour. So don't think you're as deep in the thick of it as you uh, as it may seem. You know, you you ain't going that fast. Calm down. <laughs> Unless you're biking. <laughs> oh, stop it. Alexis then threw a wrench in the plan. <laughs> Listen, that's true. <laughs> then we have, oh, <laughs> observe. Look around for landmarks. Try to find your location on a map. Bring a um, analog map with you, a paper Mm -hmm. map. Paper map. Mm -hmm. You know, Um, take out your camera. If you were taking pictures along the way, which is very smart, look at those photos. They may offer some clues. Observe the weather. Is rain imminent? You may need to take shelter. And then lastly, P. P stands for plan. Do not move until you have a plan. Like Unsure that. where to go? Can you whistle? Maybe someone will hear you. Can you play music? Which I hate when people play music on a hike. <laughs> like we out here trying to relax and you playing the latest Drake. Don't nobody even like that album. <laughs> Without their headphones. <laughs> Listen, I'm a, I don't think you, the music and hiking go together. <laughs> However, Yes, it's an it's a thing now where people just play music. I, yep. I don't get it. Mm-hmm. I sound like um an old auntie, but I hate yes, it. Do. Mm-hmm. However, if you lost, play that music, even mm-hmm. if it's the latest Drake. Ain't nobody gonna try to find you though. <laughs> they might. You know, that play, might be your saving play grace. Play some good. <laughs> yeah, baby. I don't know. I don't want to find them. Think to yourself. Them. <laughs> yeah, mm, they got terrible that taste. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's terrible. But but perhaps consider um, if you're able to retrace your route, you know, trace your steps. Should you build a fire? Can you call or text anyone? Check service periodically. Um, if all else fail, fails, there are two things to concentrate on. Number one, Alexis, what do you think that is? Your current area where you're is it safe around you oh that's a good point um are there is there anything that you should be cautious about either from humans people scary people or wildlife you know as a woman you always thinking too am i um vulnerable because i'm alone but actually what i was thinking of first is hydration because you always want to make sure you have enough water that's why it's good to have a purification system with you. Some people use tablets. Um, others have bottles with purifiers. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you do have to drink from water that is not moving, first of all, gross. <laughs> but, you know, try to pull from the middle of that pool as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Usually debris uh, floats to the outside. Mm-hmm. And then second of all, after you've you're making sure you'll you'll be hydrated. Think about warmth because exposure um, can be another thing that takes people out. Now, I read three articles to prepare for this discussion and I'll link them in the show notes. The one I pulled from most is from The Guardian and it talks about surviving in the wilderness. There is one tip from these three articles, though, that I want to share because it may ease your nerves uh, when you're hiking. It says, except in Canyon country, Walking downhill, especially in forests and mountains, will often get you out. It won't be easy and it will involve considerable bushwhacking, but eventually you'll hit a trail or old logging road. This is particularly true in the eastern states where it's essentially impossible to ever be more than 10 miles from a road. Mm. But the most remote place in the lower 48 states near the southeast corner of Yellowstone National Park is still only 23 miles from a road. Okay. You can likely walk 23 miles. Someone will likely find you if you're only 23 miles away from civilization. Okay. Um, So please do not freak out. Even if you're only moving at a crawl, keep going downhill. And after, say, 10 or 20 hours, you'll reach some form of civilization. 
You might be thinking, oh my goodness, 10, 20 <laughs> hours. But listen, you ain't got nothing else to do. You lost. Calm so down. then I could just sit down for a minute, right? I'm going to go back to that and just sit down for a minute. Take several breaks. Well, listen, we want you to be aware of the daylight hours you have left. Oh, of course. Mm. So consider that. Okay. But yes, you do want to be clear headed. Yeah. Not freaking out. You might want to sit down, rest drink water Mm -hmm. then keep it pushing so that's our theme how to survive if you're lost in the wilderness oh i like that is anything you want to add nope all right well let's take a quick break and let's get into our book okay and we're back Alexis, what can you tell us about Karen Dion and perhaps her inspiration for The Marsh King's Daughter? I got you. I got you. Okay, so Karen Dion was born in Akron, Ohio. Uh, She married in 1974 and moved with her six-week-old baby girl to the UP. That is Michigan's Upper Peninsula. In 2004, she co-founded Backspace an online community of writers dedicated to helping one another reach publishing goals. And she was already writing seriously when she started this, and she was doing that for at least five years. In 2008, her first book was published. That's called Freezing Point. And then in 2011, Mm -hmm. her second novel, um, Boiling Point, was published. These books found modest success. Then in 2015, she wrote her first psychological suspense, and that's the book that we're covering today. The book became um, a number one bestseller in Sweden and um, a bestseller in several other countries. The Marsh King's Daughter made it to the big screen in 2023. The inspiration, according to Cinemaholic, the author was inspired to write it based on her own experience of living in the wilderness for 30 years and news stories of women who had to give birth as captives. Deanne had moved to the uh, UP in Michigan, excuse me, had moved to the UP in the 70s with her husband and infant daughter. They were part of the back to the land hippie movement. They built a stone and wood cabin brought water from the nearby stream, forage for wild foods such as roots and berries. And then she began discovering the rhythm of the seasons and could recognize each species of plant and even the cause of animals and birds. So Mm, I often think we're actually designed to live in a natural, more natural habitat. I mean, I love the city, but it's probably something seriously wrong with us biologically just like a side effect of living in the city constantly, sure. whether it be our hearing or the food we digest. Yeah, I love um, being in the wild. I love hiking. I love uh, camping whenever I have an opportunity. That's always a nice adventure. So I For how long, that. though? Like how long you want to be out there? Uh, the longest <laughs> I've been out is four days, but I, I think I could go um, longer. I think I could. Like five days? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I could go no, for, for a you. month or so. I yeah. like the solitude of it. Okay. I kind of camped with you once. We got a getaway house. Yeah, we did. It was literally like five feet from the road. Uh-huh. It was terrible. From a busy highway. <laughs> it was. We didn't see no animals. <laughs> what even well, no yours were. We were further back <laughs> in the cabin. Our okay. cabin was further back. And you said you heard like all the street stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we watched Netflix. That's how close we was to civilization. <laughs> Yeah, we got to get one deeper in the wilderness, deeper in the wilderness. Yeah, an actual getaway house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Actually Mm -hmm. get away. (laughs) Actually get away. (laughs) Kari, who do you think (laughs) would enjoy reading this book? This book is like a mix of Where the Crawdads Sing by oh, Delia Owens. Exactly. Uh, Flicker in the Dark by Stacey Willingham. Remember oh, that? Did we book? read that? Yeah, that's the book about the daughter of the serial killer. Oh, OK. OK. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then I thought of Room oh, by Emma Donahue. OK, same. OK, same. So if you're into of. those stories, uh, then I think this is the book for you. 
And I don't want to say too much because I don't want to spoil this book or the other three I mentioned. But just know if you read any of those three and you liked it, this might be up your alley. And Alexis, why did you choose this book, The Marsh King's Daughter? So uh, these days, whenever I see a new movie, um, a preview, yeah. and it looks interesting, I immediately check and see if there's a book. Um, and I found mm-hmm. this and I decided, why don't we take a dive? And since this was part of our um, movie theme, jump. Yeah, we're trying yeah. to um, read books that have been turned into films uh, for this month. So yeah. yeah, great pick. Well, I mean... I shouldn't say that because I'm giving away the verdict. But I'm just saying, yes, this book was. All right, Alexis, (laughs) thank you. (laughs) Okay. And without further ado, if you're ready, let's dive into The Marsh King's Daughter by Karen Dion. The floor is yours. Okay. So, you know. Oh, spoilers ahead if I haven't said. Spoiler filled discussion. Spoiler. That's what we do if you're Um, new. Mm -hmm. You know. This book is one of those books that goes back and forth now and then, now and then kind of books. Well, I yeah. decided in my um, recounting of this story that I wasn't going to do that. So I put the front mm-hmm. in the front and the back in the back. So let us start. Um, How'd you feel about that? That time hopping? Was it confusing when you were reading it? No, it was not. I think she does a good job yeah. um, going back and forth. It was easy. To yeah, do. I agree. It's not like um, Girl on the Train, which is just abysmal. Um, <laughs> it's easy to follow, but I'm, yeah. I'm happy with your retelling. You're yeah. going in chronological order. Let's see it go. All right. So we are meeting Helena Pelletier. Pelletier? I can't remember. Sure. And she wants to tell her story, not her mother's. Her mother died two years ago at the age of 43. At her death, she had never got over her captivity. Helena was 12 years old and her mother was 28 when they were recovered from their captor. The years with her captor were spent in what the papers describe as a rundown farmhouse surrounded by swamp in the middle of Michigan's Upper Peninsula. She learned to read from a stack of National Geographic magazines from the 1950s and the collected poems of Robert Frost. During her captivity, she never went to school, never learned to ride a bicycle, never knew electricity, running water, and she never knew she was a captive until she wasn't. Maybe this is also like educated. Yeah, by, uh, educated Tara also came West through. Over. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, I mm-hmm. thought about that as well. But then I was like, well, the educated is, uh, but yeah, it, it, it does have yeah. those themes in there for sure. Mm-hmm. When she re- was reassociated with the rest of c- civilization, Helena was lacking social skills. She had to learn how to shake hands when you meet somebody, engage in small talk, raise her hand when she had a question, ask permission. Uh, she had to behave as a guest, how to behave as a guest in someone's home, washing her hands and flushing the toilet after. Uh, living by a schedule, a time clock. In the wilderness, she lived by the season. So why don't we go back to some of her childhood experiences? That's how I live too. Uh, by the season. But- <laughs> People be trying to ha- make me be on time. I'm following the season. Is that how you like to look at that? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Well, before we do that, let's talk about how her mom went missing. Her mom and her friend were planning were playing when a man showed up asking for help looking for his dog. The girls helped look and her mom is then carried off. Mm. The police didn't know immediately. In fact, it was a full week before the friend revealed that they were playing in an empty building by the railroad tracks. When a man approached them. And by this time, of course, the man and her mother were gone. Her mother was 14 at the time. Mm. Helena's earliest memory is celebrating her fifth birthday. Her mother made her a birthday cake with bear grease and duck eggs and made her a doll out of cattail rushes. Do you know what a cattail rush is, Kari? Those plants, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, 
with the brown. I, think I call them kooka bugs. That's what you call them. Because they stick on you. I don't know why, but let's not talk about it. But yeah, I know what that is. Hmm, I don't know if that's the same thing, but okay. But think of a cat's tail and you'll know what it is. You've seen everyone's. Sure. I'm talking to the readers oh, now. Okay. The literati. All right. You've seen that. <laughs> Helena uh, was unimpressed with her mom's cattail rushes. Helena was rude. She's a terrible child. Her mother is a, um, what you call it, a victim. She pieces together whatever she can find to make her little girl a doll. And Helena goes, ugh. Like, what am I supposed to do with that exactly? Ain't no Barbies in the woods. Just kidding. (laughs) Helena didn't know what a Barbie was. Didn't even know. Her father, however, mm-hmm. gifted her a knife from his knife set. He revealed the knife set to her. He pulled it out from under the bed. It had many styles um, and sizes of knife. Now, this is not your mom's kitchen set knife. It's different. It's mm-hmm. expansive. Okay. These were for hunting, for combat, for self-defense. And her father would eventually teach her to use all of them. That mm-hmm. evening when she got her um, knife that she was able to pick out of his set, he took her um, to one of the many rabbit snares um, to look for a live rabbit. And when they came across one, she was allowed to slit the rabbit's throat and the blood splattered all over her. Her father praised her. And as you know, Helena is five. And she's now acknowledged as a worthy and respected, a, a worthy of respect and honor hunter. She's a hunter now because mm-hmm. she slit the rabbit's throat. When Helena was eight years old, she smashed her thumb with a hammer uh, while working on what her mother called a sauna. So they were building a, um, a family sauna. I think, mm-hmm. yeah, I'll leave it at that. And um, it wasn't broken. When she smashed it. Uh, So later it was wrapped up. Okay. Later, her father asked her if she was still hurting. And in an effort to teach her to be more careful and that accidents have consequences, he unwrapped her injured finger and smashed it with his fist. She She passed passed out. out So his thing is like, you can't have accidents the way we live. Mm -hmm. Because, you know. It ain't like he's going to take her to the hospital. It's not. It, she didn't know that. She, she didn't even know that was yeah, an she option. She don't even know what a hospital mm-hmm. is, I don't think. No, no, probably. she doesn't. Mm-hmm. And when she came to consciousness, uh, he made her eat dinner. And she held back her tears because she knew her father did not like tears. And her mother watched this all happen. And it was a long time before she was able to forgive her mother for this. Now. Once her father tried to drown her mother, and that was when she was 11 years old. Now, you really fast forward it. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah. If there's something you like to include, throw it in there. I don't mind. I do not care for Helena. So go ahead with the story. <laughs> okay. What happened? Why, do, why did the dad try to drown her mother? So by the time Helena was 11, um, she was changing. The marsh was becoming claustrophobic to her and she was longing to see and do new things and during her time with her father um one day with her mom they her mom was making jam and she told her mom where there were other strawberries um and her mom just needed to get in a canoe and go over there now her mom asked helena to do it but helena was like i ain't doing that i don't feel like it As soon as she took the knife all those years ago from her father and um, discarded the doll that her mother made her, she set in her mind that she never has to listen to her mother. She sure did. Her mother is inconsequential. So whenever her mother tells her to do something, if her dad doesn't require her to do it, she completely ignores that woman. Mm -hmm. And that woman is the 14 year old girl that was kidnapped, who is growing up now with this child uh, who is a beast. (laughs) <laughs> the mom is going to get in a canoe and go to the other side and get these strawberries. And the father comes home and asks where mom is. Helena is like, oh, she just went over there to get some strawberries on the other side. She took the canoe. 
When he found out, he raced after her, caught her before she pushed off, grabbed her by her hair, yanked her out of the canoe, grabbed her back up the hill to their porch and tried to drown her in a bucket of water. Now, Helena thought her mother was dead. She had always been afraid of her father, but in a healthy way. She just didn't want to disappoint him. Now she was terrified of him. And of course, she still did not know that her mother was her father's prisoner. Now, Helena loved her father. He taught her everything she knew. And she even felt closer to her mother than she did her father. Her father was... No, she felt closer to her father than she did her mother. Right. Her father (laughs) than her mother. Her father would take her out on these outings and uh, just, you know, tell her things. And she learned things about hunting and survival in the marsh. She got all her skills from him. One outing, her father took her on. It was, she didn't know where she was going. And, but he ended up taking her across the river. It is something that she had long to do. But he had given her several warnings saying, listen, don't go across the river because it's um, uncertain when it freezes over. You never know. It's the thickness in the various places you could fall through. Don't do it. But today he was walking her across the river. She walked across the frozen ice trying to follow her father's footsteps exactly so she wouldn't fall. And when they made it across, They then walked along the river and came to a waterfall. And as she and her father enjoyed the view, Helena saw for the first time people, a mother and a father. Mm -hmm. And then she saw children. She saw a family. She could see the family laughing, having fun, talking. And when she saw this family, she knew she had to leave the marsh. She had to go. She'd never seen other people. Right. And then these people were interacting with each other as a family in a way she'd never experienced. Communicating. The mother was talking. They were laughing together. I don't even know if they laughed, except uh, the father would laugh sometimes when he felt particularly evil. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There was another experience in her life when she was in her 11, when she was 11. And... This is when I think they ran out of salt. Is this when they ran out of salt and they had to go look for salt when he punished her by putting her in the well? Do you remember that experience, Kari? He would just put her. That was just her regular. That was capital punishment in their household. Yeah. For him to put her in a well. And then she started like using that time in solitary confinement for meditation. He was like, oh, no, we can't have that. So he threw like debris in there and sharp objects Mm -hmm. so that she would never feel comfortable down there. Yeah. Um, And so when she was looking for salt. (laughs) I was like, at least this family appreciates seasoning. Uh, The mother freaked out. The mother never spoke up. But once they ran out of salt, the mother was like, why would he let this happen? How could he let this happen? And so they forcing down their food and the mother's like, "Mm -mm, this good. So obviously the mom has some secret salt. She ain't telling people about. (laughs) And so, like you said, yeah, Helena goes to look for that secret salt and she makes it to the outhouse. Is that where you're going? Yeah. So that's a little sooner. But let's go back just a little bit and talk about when um, her father had gone out and he had been hunting and he was never bringing something back. So he felt like he was cursed. So Mm -hmm. he took his daughter Mm -hmm. out. He took Helena out with him to hunt and he told her to shoot this wolf and she did not shoot the wolf. She decided, oh, no, if I shoot the wolf. I mean, I'm killing the wolf and I don't really want to kill the wolf. It was something that happened to her that made her now rethink this idea of killing the wolf. Well, he did. They have a dog yet. Yep. They still had the dog. Maybe that was it because she's killed animals before. Right. Right. She killed the rabbit. Yeah. And they have a, a home full of dead rabbits for food. So. Oh, you know what? That was it, too. She felt like they had enough meat. That's what it was. She said he was doing it over hunting. Yes, that's what it was. He's like over hunting. And that's wrong. Exactly. That's right. Thanks for that reminder. Well, as punishment, Mm -hmm. he threw her in this well. And like Kari said, 
he had filled the bottom with um, um, stuff like deer antlers, rib bones, broken glass, shattered dishes, anything that would hurt or cut her if she tried to sit down. And so she squatted on her heels in the darkness. Um, uh, it was a time of contemplation and contemplation apparently was not supposed to be uh, comfortable. Let's see. So the way she was in there, she had her ha- arms stretched above her head um, and she did whatever she could to, you know, be comfortable, even though she was in this uncomfortable spot. OK, so she was in this well for like three days. She didn't know what time of day. She didn't know anything because she's locked in as well. It's dark. There's no light. She's there's no communication. At some point she starts Mm -hmm. hallucinating. At some point she starts hallucinating about those children she saw um, by the waterfall and she made them her imaginary friends and her imaginary friends would tell her that her father didn't love her. And when she came out of the well, her mother thought she was dead because when her um, father brought her in the house, he threw her on the kitchen floor like a sack of potatoes. And at that time, mm. her mom thinking she was dead, what she did was strip down and try to warm her body um, and put a blanket on her. So she got closer and put a blanket on her just to try to bring her back to warmth. She wasn't dead. Mm-hmm. She was just frozen because it was so cold out there. And She'd been in a hole for three days. Three days, yeah. And at that point, she did realize that her father did not love her. And um, he would do whatever he wanted without regard for her safety or her feelings. And after that experience, now, she wasn't aware of the experience, but her mother told her what happened when she um, came out of the well. And mm-hmm. she was no longer indifferent towards her mother um, as she was previously. Her mother was angry at her father for what he tried to do. And her father was still angry at her and her mo- at Helena, and she was he was angry at the mother for trying to care for Helena after he pulled her out of the well. So he would stay mm-hmm. away from the cabin often. Um, he said just looking at the mother and Helena made him sick. So then we jump to the part where the salt runs out that Kari mentioned. And so while Helena is looking for this salt, she comes across teen magazine she starts to page through it and um she's like oh these these are interesting and you know all the latest but old latest things that teens Mm -hmm. were doing at the time and when her mother comes in and sees her looking at this magazine she's like where'd you get that from what are you doing with it that's mine give it to me and for her mother to say that's mine, she knows her mother doesn't own anything. So why would this be such a big deal? So Helena uh, sna- uh, slaps her mother's hand for trying to take the the magazine and then pulls out a knife on her. On her mother. On her Helena mother. Helena is the worst. So this captive who has now been forced to raise an ungrateful <laughs> daughter, the only thing she has is a teen magazine. The girl, the little girl has found it. And instead of giving it back to her mother, pulls out a knife. Yeah. And so Helena's like, where'd you get this from? Helena's mom, when she when she found out she was pregnant, the dad did an incredible thing. He took Helena's mom to Kmart to buy children's clothes and a teenager's her. clothes mm-hmm. and adult clothes. All the clothes that this child would need in life, they bought in one visit. They bought all the shoes that the child would need growing up two for in everything. one visit. Mm-hmm. Bought, like Alexa said, two for everything, something to wear and something to wash. Yeah. Mm-hmm. OK. And as Helena grows up and has her own child, she realizes kids might wear five outfits in one day especially when they real little and they get messy all the time. All her mother, all she had though, when she was a child were two of everything. So her mother would just be constantly washing clothes. While they were checking out though, at Kmart, Helena's mom tucked away this magazine, stole the magazine and um, yeah. And they, and they left. Mm -hmm. The chilling part of this is he knew he could take her to Kmart, even though people were supposed to be looking for her. She would disappear. She would be inconsequential. No one would 
uh, recognize her or care yeah. that she looked distraught. And he and so he felt comfortable enough to take her to Kmart. Yeah. And he had um, this was about two years after he had her captive and he had drilled it in her head that no one was looking for her. So she yeah, just that's worked right. in mm-hmm. with that. And so because of all of this, Helena soon realized that the magazine was as old as she is, 12 years old. She soon realized that the National Geographic that she loved were 50 years old. And at this point... She thought the people she was looking at in Nat Geo, like it was current right now news. So this is a shock to her system to learn that years exist and you should pay attention to them. (laughs) And so at this point, she decides that her mother is a liar for not telling her that information that she was reading was old. And as she's making these realizations, a snowmobile pulls up. Someone was coming to the cabin. That never happens. Never happens. And there's protocol if it if it ever happens. And her father had um, made sure in all his efforts that no attention was drawn to the cabin. And so as this snowmobile is pulling up, they're like, her mom's like, go hide. And Helena's like, but where am I hide? The the man is right there. Mm -hmm. Because usually they just leave the house, but they were cooking. They were in the middle of something. They were had, there was food on the stove. Lots was going on. But also the dog was barking or whining. So Helena goes out there and unleashes the dog and then kind of hides behind the the woodshed. And then the man gets out, kind of plays with the dog a little bit and then comes to the door. It's like, hello, anybody home? Her mother comes out and he says um, he was separated from his group, lost on the trail. His cell battery was dead. He just wanted to use the phone. That's all. And he said his name. His name was John Luca. Lukanen, Lukanen, and uh, Helena heard her mother say that she knew him, and she pulled him into the house. Now, this is just like the beginning, because Helena was already thinking her mom was lying, but now she mm-hmm. sees her pull this man into the house and say he knows her. He coming by when her father is gone. The trickery. What's going on? Deception. She didn't know what was going on, but she knew what what her mother was doing was wrong. She saw her mother speaking excitedly and scared. And then she saw her mother lean in and kiss this man on the cheek. Something is not right. She saw her mother lay her head on the man's shoulder. Helena knew what a kiss meant. It means you love that person. And that was why her mother never kissed her father. And now she's kissing another man. She couldn't believe it. So she burst through the door with her knife, telling the man he had to leave. Before they had a chance, the man came in behind, excuse me, Helena's father came in behind mm-hmm. her, rifle in hand. John, the um, the man from the snowmobile, quickly says he got lost, your wife. And her father's like, no, shut up. He takes him outside. Wait, beats before him up. this, before before the dad walks in um, and that little bad girl comes in <laughs> with the knife, the mom is like, please stop. This man is going to save us. I know him. Please stop. And it's too late. The girl is like, it's just hard headed. She won't listen to anything her mom is saying. And then the dad walks in, like you mm-hmm. said. Go ahead. So he, her father takes him out, the man outside, beats him up breaks his arm, and then takes him into the woodshed. Okay, so when he returns, he tells Helena to go to her room, and then he beats the mom. Now, Kari, I want you to read this um, this section of the book for us, okay? All right. It says, Helena, my mother cried. The man and my mother pulled apart as cold air swept the cabin. Her face was flushed. I thought you were... Never mind, hurry, shut the door. I left the door open. You have to leave. I told the man as harshly as I could. Now, I waved my knife so he'd know I meant business. I'd use it if I had to. The man backed away, put up his hands. Whoa, easy. Put the knife down. It's okay. I'm not going to hurt you. Talking to me like I was my dog. I made my face as hard as my father's and took a step closer. You have to go now before my father comes back. 
My mother's face turned white when I mentioned my father's, as it should. I didn't know what she was thinking when she brought this man into our cabin, how she thought this might end. She sank down into a chair. Helena, please, you don't understand. This man is our friend. Our friend? Our friend? I saw you kiss him. I saw you. You saw... Oh, Helena, no, no. I was only thanking John because he's going to take us away. Put your knife down. We have to hurry. I looked at my mother, excited, hopeful, happy, like this was the best day of her life because this man showed up on our ridge. All I could think was that she was out of her mind. I knew she didn't like living in the marsh, but did she really think she could leave now in the cold and the dark? Get on the snowmobile behind this stranger and let him take her away without my father's permission? I couldn't imagine why she would think for a second that I would agree to this plan. Please, Helena, I know you're scared. I most certainly was not. And this all is very confusing. I was not a bit confused. But you have to trust me. Trust her. The magazine in my back pocket burned like an ember. After this, I would never trust my mother again. Helena, please, I'll explain everything, I promise. But we have to hur- She broke off as my father's footsteps clomped across the porch. What's going on? He roared as he burst into the room. He sized up the situation in an instant and swung his rifle between the man and my mother like he couldn't decide which of them he should shoot first. The man held up his hands. Please, I don't want any trouble. Shut up. Sit down. The man fell into one of our kitchen chairs like he'd been pushed. Look here now. There's no need for the gun. I just want to use your phone. I got lost. Your um, wife let me in and I said, shut up. My father spun on his heel and smashed the rifle butt into the man's gut. The man gasped and toppled off the chair and rolled around on the floor, moaning and clutching his stomach. No, my mother screamed and covered her face. My father handed me the rifle. If he moves, shoot him. He stood over my mother and drew back his fist. The man scrambled to his knees, crawled toward my father, grabbed my father's ankle. I knew I should shoot. I didn't want to pull the trigger. Leave her alone, the man cried. I know who you are. I know what you did. My father froze, yeah. whirled around. There was an article in one of the geographics that described a person's face as being black with rage. My father looked like that now, angry enough to kill us all. He roared like a wounded black bear advanced on the man, kicked him in his kidney. The man cried out and fell face down on the floor. My father grabbed the man's left wrist and planted his foot on the man's elbow, then twisted the man's arm higher and higher behind his back until the bone snapped. The man's scream filled the cabin, mixed with my mother's, my own. My father grabbed the man by his broken arm and yanked him to his feet. The man screamed again, please, no, oh God, no, stop, please, he yelled as my father marched him across the yard to the woodshed. My mother sobbed. My hand shook. I looked down and realized I was still holding the rifle. The rifle was pointed at my mother. My mother was looking at me like she thought I was going to shoot her. I didn't tell her the safety was on. My father came back into the cabin. His jacket was bloody and his knuckles were red. He took the rifle from my shaking hands and locked it in the storage room. I waited in the kitchen with my mother. I wasn't sure what he wanted to do. When he came back, his expression was calm, like nothing had happened, like this was an ordinary day and he didn't just break the arm of the first person to show up on our ridge. This could have meant one of two things. His anger was spent or he was just getting started. Go to your room, Helena. I ran up the stairs. Behind me, I heard the sound of a fist hitting flesh. My mother screamed. I shut the door. Oh, thank you, Kari. That was good reading. Listen, I'm going to have trouble sleeping at night. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alexis. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> the next morning, um, her mom is still in bed and she knew it. Um, it was because her father had beat up her mom. Helena said she didn't like when her father beat her mom, but sometimes she deserved it. And her father mm. told her it was because her mother brought another man in the cabin and they committed adultery. And when an Ojib Ojibwe woman commits adultery, her husband has the right to mutilate her, 
even kill her as he saw fit. So her father also tells her she needs to take care of the men outside by giving him like something to drink. So she goes outside mm-hmm. to the woodshed, sees the man. Chicory. Mm-hmm. Um, his hair was his hair and face were bloody. His face was also swollen. Um, he had thermal underwear on and nothing else. His arms were handcuffed above his head. And um she brought the chicory along with a biscuit and she fed him. He asked if her mom was all right, and he said her father was crazy and Helena didn't like that. He said he didn't know that her mother had been there all along after all these years. Someone finally found her. He then quickly realized that Helena had no idea what he was talking about. He didn't know what happened to her mother. And Helena is like, no what? She didn't know what happened to her mother. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She didn't know what happened to her mother. And as she's saying, mm-hmm. no what? Her father walks in and sends Helena away and Helena can hear her father beating up the man again. Um, And Helena just wondered what was he going to tell her? She wanted to know really badly what this man was going to tell her. But for the next few days, she was kept in the house um, with her mom. And her father took her um, to the woodshed at some point. They went back to the woodshed together. and she watched her father um, torture the man by tattooing words on his chest. As he tattooed Mm -hmm. the man with his knife, um, the man passed out. She told her mother um, what he did and her mother showed Helena hers. So she opened her shirt and showed that her father had tattooed slut and whore on her. Helena would soon go back to the woodshed And when she does go back to the woodshed, because, again, her father is asking her to help the man by giving him the chicory. Um, The man begged Helena to help him. She could see that the man was worse off, that if he didn't get out of here, he'd he'd be dead. Um, He told Mm -hmm. Helena that her father. It looked like, too, like the father had smeared feces in the wounds. Yeah, that's gross. So they weren't going to heal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He told Helena uh, her father was a bad man and she asked what he did. And he told her that when your mother was a young girl around your age, he stole her from her family. Your father kidnapped your mother and told her to go ask her mother about it. Now, Helena was familiar with the word kidnapping, but she didn't think anything was wrong with it. And then her mother um, presented um, the scenario. What if someone took you away from us? What um, what would you do? How would you feel? And then she understood Mm -hmm. that the kidnapping would. She was like, I'd kill that person. Mm -hmm. Oh, so when she Mm -hmm. went back to the woodshed, uh, John convinced her to take the snowmobile and get help. There was an extra key and um, she didn't do it right away. So by the third morning. Helena was reminded of a story her mother used to tell her of the Marsh King's daughter Mm -hmm. by Hans Christian Andersen. Kari, can you give us a synopsis of that? No, it was hard to follow. Yes. Okay. Um, A woman woke up (laughs) and a baby was a frog. I'm glad you said that. And then the baby was the demon. (laughs) And then the baby was a princess. And I said, I do not care about this. Now, is Hans Christian, he the mermaid man, right? Oh, is he? Okay. But he does have a lot of uh, stories like that. So, and it's some of them weird, grim stories, like the Grimm like brothers. The brothers Grimm, yeah. Mm-hmm. So sure. anyway, so she was reminded of that story. Oh no, he's Cinderella, ain't he? Ain't that Hans Christian Cinderella? Anderson? Is he? Hans Christian Andersen is a Danish author known for such stories as The Snow Queen, The Little Mermaid, The, Little Mermaid. the Ugly Duckling. And other things Disney has ripped off. <laughs> it doesn't say that. <laughs> okay. That's it. In any event, that's the story. So she's decided she was going to. She said that's the story. Like I told y'all what it is. This story is hard to follow in the book, y'all. And it's inconsequential. It's, it, that's it. No one cares. That's the point. Um, so <laughs> she decided to gather up her mother and leave that day. 
But before she did, she goes in to thank John for uh, all that he did for her. But he was too far gone. So she slit his throat. Helena slit Yeah, she knows he's not going to get better. And so she takes the law in her own hands. And she's like, when I leave with my mother, my father's going to come in here and do some really bad things to you. So I'm going to help you. By slitting in your throat mm-hmm. like you were rabbit. And he he wasn't responsive um, when she went very res- he wasn't responsive when she went back and left on the snowmobile with her um, mother. But her father came up just as that was happening. He shoots at him, shoots her dog, shoots the mom, but they get away. No, this is a great scene where he has one bullet left. And it's like the between her and her hero. dog, which one will, will he shoot his daughter or will he shoot his daughter's dog? And so the dog decides, even though the dog is injured at this point, the dog runs to the dad and like is creating a diversion, a knowing yeah. that this gives his human, the daughter, time to get away. And so the daughter gets away because her dog sacrificed himself. Mm-hmm. OK, so let's get to now. Let's get to the present day. That was the past. and. Helena is making deliveries. She sells jams and jellies um, to the local shops and groceries in the UP. Uh, Her trademark is the cattail blueberry jelly. And um, she makes her deliveries with her daughter sometimes when her husband is not available to keep the the young girl. And then she goes to the beach and realizes that uh, she's a bit behind and she needs to go pick up her daughter or or meet her five-year-old daughter. And as she's speeding down the road, hoping she is not stopped by the police, she turns on the radio and hears the news report of an escaped prisoner. It said, once again, state police report that a prisoner serving life without parole for child abduction, rape and murder has escaped from the maximum security prison in Marquette, Michigan. Listeners are to be alerted that the prisoner is armed and dangerous. Do not repeat. Do not approach. If you see anything suspicious, call the prisoner. Jacob Holbrook was convicted of kidnapping a young girl and keeping her captive for a dozen years in a notorious case that received nationwide attention. Her heart stops and she pulls herself over to gather herself because Jacob Holbrook has escaped from prison. The Marsh King. She didn't even know her dad's name till the authorities tracked him down all those years ago. It's her father. So, yeah, to hear his name again is very chilling. Mm-hmm. So the police believe that he's headed to the wildlife refuge where Helena knows um, that's only a distraction. Her father is pretty skilled at what he does. He knows how to put people off his trail. Um, so she knows he's obviously headed somewhere. And so she gathers herself together and speeds home because what is her concern, Kari? Because her children are at the house and she doesn't want her father to get his That's hands right. on her kids. That's right. So she's, um, this is an irrational feeling, right? Because she are, her father hasn't been gone long enough to get to her house. And then also she knows she's changed her name. She doesn't have a long online presence. There's no way that her father knows where she is, even though she's living on the property he grew up on. This is what she's thinking. This is so slow because she got the house from her paternal grandparents. So, yeah, he could guess where she's living. She didn't think he'd ever get out either. Also that. And she doesn't think he has access to the Internet because they shouldn't have access to the right. internet. That was weird. Did you hear how she was like, and prisoners don't have access to the internet? Yeah. And I was like, you sure? Yeah. Because yeah. I, I'm, is, <laughs> the, today okay. they do. Let's all, let's, <laughs> I mean, they got whole TikToks accounts. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I know some prisoners that have access to the exactly. internet. I hope, mm-hmm. I mean, I thought that was, everybody knew that. Well, no. maybe not in 2015. They weren't supposed to have it. OK, sure. Uh-huh. So and her husband doesn't know that she was held captive for 12 years and the child of a convicted murderer, rapist and kidnapper. Her husband does not know that. He and don't even neither know her, does her real children. Name. Let's talk about her father, Jacob Holbrook. That's not his real name, but that's the name she knows him by. 
her paternal grandfather was a full-blooded Ojibwe and her grandmother, her paternal grandmother was of the Finns. That's how they said it in the book. Her paternal grandparents met and married in their late 30s and they had their her father five years later. The grandparents were characterized as perfectionists, too old, too rigid, and he was punished for the little bit of infraction, the least thing he did wrong. He was, yeah, he's likely abused as a child, right? Mm. Yeah. Uh, He was kicked out of the house after he dropped out of school in the 10th grade. He joined the army. Um, He was dishonorably discharged from the army because he didn't get along with others, nor did he follow the directions of his commanding officers. Jacob was 35 Mm -hmm. when he took Helena's mother, 50 when he left the marsh, and 52 when he was finally captured. And he has spent the last 13 years in prison. Helena was expected to hate her father because of what he did to her mother, but she grew up idolizing her father and never, ever understood why her mother was always angry. She often felt sorry for her father and looked at the situation from his point of view. He was mentally ill, flawed. He was diagnosed with an antisocial personality disorder. He also suffered um, a traumatic brain injury from being hit on the head by his um, parents. Um, She knew her father as a smart, funny, patient, and kind man. And he took care of her, clothed and fed her, taught her everything she needed to know to thrive in the march, not just survive, but thrive. Mm-hmm. The prison she drives by often is actually 50 miles from her home, but she has never visited her father. Eventually, the police are coming to her house. So when she makes it there to her house, she's like, oh, I need to get ready for the, whatever's going to happen because I got to tell my husband. But before she could tell her husband, the police come and behind the police is her husband. Her husband is Stephen. Mm. And of course, the husband is immediately worried when he sees the police at their house. So before she can tell her husband the circumstances of her life, the police ask her if they can ask her questions about her father, Jacob Holbrook. And her husband is immediately shocked because, like we said, she does not know her father. He does not know his wife was in this situation. And all she can do Mm -hmm. is answer the officer's questions. So um, the questions imply that she's been in touch with him and even possibly helped her husband escape. Um, In her mind... Helped her father escape. Yeah, help... hmm? Say it again. You said helped her husband escape. The questions imply... The the officer is like, yeah. Yeah. Is that you don't know anything else? Yeah. You don't know where he might be going? He hasn't contacted you? That's how they question people. So... That's how always. Yeah, so this is how in her mm-hmm. mind, she like, I done created my own witness protection plan. My father don't know where I am and I know where he is. So I'm protected. So fine. I'm just staying in the house he grew up yeah. in. He'll never find He'll me. He'll never find me. Her husband um, is asked the police officer, sir, if the family is in d- danger. And he suggests if you can go somewhere, you better go for your own safety. So Helena doesn't think her father would come. So she kind of interjects and says that, but she cannot guarantee that. She doesn't know. Um, And then through this fight to say he would never come here, it's revealed that they're Mm -hmm. living in the house that her, the, on the grounds her father grew up on. So after, right, because she tore down the house to build another house. Yeah. So after the police leave, but it's the same property. Stephen mm-hmm. immediately starts packing the children. Helena packs up after they fight because they 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 gonna fight about this. They have a little mm-hmm. argument, and he's like, "We getting out of here." And Helena packs up her husband's clothes, and she tells her husband though she's not going to his parents' house with them. They need to go away. She's going to help the police find her father. But really, Helena decides that. She is the only one who can find her father and return him to prison. And she also wants to prove to her husband that her family is important to her. So she packs up her gear Mm -hmm. and heads out the next morning to find her father. She has an idea um, of how she thinks her father is traveling and avoiding detection. She believes that during the day, he's likely holed up in somebody's cabin, empty cabin. So she starts out with her dog, her three-legged dog, 
and um, she's looking for this cabin to see uh, where he might be staying before it gets dark because she knows once it's um, once it gets dark, her father will be on the move. And she believes her father is heading for Canada. So she's heading along uh, on the road. She's driving, you know, looking for this cabin. She receives a text from her husband that says he'll be home in half an hour. Get um, the girls are at my parents. Don't worry. We'll get through this. So she didn't expect we'll that. We'll get through this together. Yeah. She thought her marriage was you, over. Baby. Mm-hmm. So when the father escaped from prison, he used a knife made from toilet paper and he stabbed one guard and shot the other and took the weapons and the prison van. I kind of wanted crashed. to make this knife the way they described it. Me too. It. I watched a video on how okay, to make it. Okay, let's make shivs. Okay. <sighs> okay, we'll make shivs and we'll document it on the TikTok. On the TikTok. Because that's where trifling content belongs. <laughs> I watched the video so I know how and it's And you done. know what? Let's make toilet wine. What's the big deal? Toilet wine? <laughs> no, just oh. kidding. <laughs> oh, you never heard of that. Oh, That's fine. Thank you. Uh, no, let's just make the shit out of toilet sure, paper. Sure, sure. We'll let's do that. do that. Okay. So anyway, mm-hmm. that's how the father escaped. So she's driving along the road and she notices a parked patrol car. She gets out to investigate it, to investigate the um, vehicle. And she finds an officer's dead body at the bottom of the ravine. And she goes closer to check to see if the officer is still breathing. And she turns him over and she sees the message written in blood, excuse me, written on his bloody chest um, for H. The H is Helena. So her father Mm -hmm. anticipated Helena would come looking for him. Um, So now it makes sense to call in that she's found this officer's body, but she has opted not to do that. She is determined to catch her father and return him to prison. Her father also um, left something behind um, for her. Um, and she has her dog sniff it for his scent. They take another break. Now, they're not that far from the house, but they take. But she now has to go to the bathroom. So she gets out of the car, goes to the bathroom, and she her dog sniffs out um, another agate that's what it's called an agate a lake superior agate Mm -hmm. and realizes her father is in this area so she's like oh i was thinking i was at the top of my game but my father is really better than me at this hunting thing she's like her father could sneak up on her at any moment then she thinks maybe just maybe her father is not taunting her but yet inviting her like I um I haven't forgotten you. I care about you and I want to see you. Maybe he loves before me. Before I, I disappear. Mm-hmm. Just maybe. Yeah. Maybe. So she takes her dog back to the truck, kind of um chains him in the back of it, and then locks up the vehicle and then goes out on foot to find this cabin. And she does right. find the cabin. When she gets to the cabin, it appears empty and the TV's on and the news is given an update on her father. Um, and as she's kind of absorbing the uh, the atmosphere, yeah. she's like, I can smell that someone was cooking eggs, but then there was a scuffle. Oh, and a gun <laughs> and um, some blood. Um, what's going on? And a recently fired uh, <laughs> A gun. So as she gets yeah. to the kitchen, she finds a naked man. And then the book does something that is unforgivable. Uh-oh. Go ahead. What did they do? You're going to get okay. to it. Maybe not. So a naked man is lying on the you side are. between the table and the stove. His blood and brains are splattered on the floor. And Hel- Helena immediately thinks it's her husband, but it's not. No, no. In the book, she goes, Steven. Yeah. End of chapter. Next chapter takes you somewhere else that you do not care about <laughs> the past. So we have found as the reader, her husband who loves her and is waiting for her and saying, we'll work through this together. Naked and dead. The chapter ends. And now we're back to her childhood. We don't care about that childhood. <laughs> we want to know what happened to the husband. I just thought- it comes back to the husband. After a waste your time in the past and goes, it wasn't him. Just kidding. It just seems so far-fetched, but though. It could have been. 
<laughs> it seems so far fetched. I said, oh, oh, we went to creative writing class and we did not take notes. <laughs> I just thought it was so far fetched. So I did not give in to that. I was like, that's dumb. Yeah. <laughs> And how can it be her husband? <laughs> well, you smarter than me because I was like, oh, man, Stephen did. No. I barely knew you, Stephen. No. And that's another problem in the book. You don't know this husband and kids. <laughs> They're not real. Yeah. They don't feel so real. So we're not. So that's not Stephen, as we know. And um, she thinks about what happened to the man and what her father did. And she decides that she is done with this because her father is really like, out there and she don't want to look no more yeah his body count is up mm-hmm. <laughs> and she wants to go I don't home know why I'm laughing it's dark to her husband mm-hmm. and then so she pulls out her phone she's going to call I don't know if she was going to call the police or not but she's looking at her phone and while it doesn't really have a signal the message comes through and her husband is asking where are you are you okay call me come home please we need mm-hmm. to talk um, but there's no signal she can't make the call so she heads back to the truck and meanwhile it's thundering and raining when she arrives at the truck, she's thinking she should hear her dog at least barking because it's raining. But no, she sees her tires mm-hmm. are slashed and the dog is gone. Now, now she knows that her father wasn't trying to just see her again, but he is indeed testing her. He's like, I taught you everything you knew. Now let's see what you learned, how well you learned it. So she can see the tracks from the Mm -hmm. dog and her father, and she can tell it's leading back towards her home. Again, they're not far from her home. In fact, they're about five miles away. And she can tell the the prints in the road spell out a message that's impossible. She feels like it's impossible to miss. Um, Helena grabs her ammunition, her rifle, her magnum and from the truck and then heads home. Um, she texts Stephen, hoping that the message will go through, telling him to clear out, get out of the house. If you're home, get out of there. She doesn't follow the path her father expects her to take. Again, she's less than five miles from the house. Um, so she tries to go another route. Again, she's trying to beat her father at his game. She starts running and she soon hears a dog bark. So she knows she's she's gotten close. She gets closer. She can see her father now. And so from the distance she's at, she sees her father and she decides she's going to take a shot. There's a branch above him. So she sh- shoots at the branch and the branch falls directly in front of him. So her father knows it's like, ah, oh, the jig is up. Um, this is the same move that ended their last hunting and tracking game. So her father freezes and then she remembers just because a man looks like he's beaten doesn't mean he's ready to give up. Mm -hmm. especially when a man is as devious and as manipulative as her father. She calls his name and he calls her um, by her nickname. Little Shadow. Say it again. Little Shadow. Um, By her nickname, yeah. And she begins to soften. Memories flood in. uh, But she's telling her father, toss your weapon. And he starts tossing the stuff. But she's still going through the memories and everything. And um, mm-hmm. he 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 had a couple of guns, so he's tossing them out. He also has a knife, but then he has a gun behind, and he looks like he's about to throw it, but actually he shoots her. He shoots her in the shoulder, and she's shocked that he would shoot her. Um, and all she could think, she didn't beat him. She didn't save her family. She didn't win because my father changed the rules of our game once again. Her father, um, after he shoots her, he drags her by her hair. Um, and ties her to the tree. Well, I won't say by her hair. It doesn't say that. I don't think it says that. Anyway, he drags her and ties her to the tree. He tells her it's his fault. It's her fault. She He shot her. <laughs> yeah, he tells her she should have never left. She ruined everything. Um, Helena tells her father that her mother died. He tells her her mother was a disappointment. And she should have taken, he should have taken the other one. And then Jacob, that's her father, reveals to Helena that he is taking her and her daughters, his grandchildren, to Canada. Now, Helena is shocked because, like I said, she thought she, you know, she had made herself invisible. She don't understand how he even knows about her family. So she's like, well, what makes you think I have a family? 
And he pulls out a copy of a magazine, the Traverse magazine, and it's um and he it's open to the page where she, her husband, and the girls got a full page spread. And she thought she covered her tracks well enough that the article wouldn't be a problem, but that wasn't true. Helena and her father head home, um, head towards her home. And so she comes up with a plan that she's going to throw herself off a cliff and she and pretends to be injured or, or dead. And then that way she can mm-hmm. make a plan to get to her house before her father does. And she does this. And so she races her home and sets up that next trap. And she kind of rolls herself in mud and kind of hides because it's raining hides and Mm -hmm. when her father comes upon her trap her being the human trap they scuffle and shuffle and fight it out a little (laughs) bit and she gets Mm -hmm. to the gets the better of him and she eventually shoots her father and he dies and that she shoots him by shooting through herself Mm -hmm. It would have never occurred to him that someone would sacrifice themselves for someone mm-hmm. else because he's a narcissist. Right. So she's like, that's your weakness and that's how I'll get you. And she got him. And that brings us to the end of our story. Shall we take a break? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and we're back. Harry. Yes. So what is your final verdict? And would you recommend this book? This book does a great job of creating tension. Um, I felt throughout the book invested in one particular storyline out of the many. And that was, would her father find her? When he did, what was he going to do to her? I I was uh, from the beginning invested in that that thread. Um, So I felt at the end um, satisfied with the conclusion of the plot. However, there are some reasons for pause to me. The first, the way Native Americans are described, I I am not sure I'm okay with. There is honor giving to this practice of living off the land and knowing your way through nature. And that is valued. Mm -hmm as opposed to relying on conveniences, modern conveniences. Okay. However, uh, her father's grandmother was a beautiful Finnish woman to her. And um, then her mother was taken and her mother was also a clean, pure, uh, what are they? They're Finnish too or something? Oh, oh, whose mother was taken? Or Viking. She felt like she was like, oh, I'm a Viking. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, um, and then the Native American man is like the beast of the story. Mm -hmm. Uh, There there are no uh, kind Native Americans in the story, no uh, emotionally intelligent Native Americans. Uh, The bad people in this story are the Native American grandparents who abuse their child, and then the father who ends up being a monster. Um, So that matters, because this is a fictional story. It isn't based on fact, and then the writer is white. Mm. So uh, it's a little icky. Um, Second, take all of that out. Uh, Who cares about these kids and the (laughs) husband? You barely meet them. (laughs) And they are like the crux that her actions rest upon. They are the reason. They are her motivation at the end. And you barely know them. You're like, "Mm, okay. Uh, I don't think this book needed the backstory it gave her, not the backstory, the but the context it gave her, the children and the husband. And if it was going to use them, well, let's get to know them a little bit. Let's have at least a scene, one scene with all of them together that shows how much they are invested in each they other. They have the scene at the end of the book. So that the stakes are high. They hmm? have the scene at the end of the book. Not the end of the book. So do y'all know what I'm talking about, Literati? <laughs> you got to make us care before we get to the story. <laughs> Not at the end. So that's the problem. Um, however, there are some things, like I said, that the book does well. Tension is great. Uh, the way it describes tracking, I felt like was plausible with my limited knowledge. It felt believable. Um, 
And I was interested in the story. I was on the edge of my seat for some parts and I never felt bored reading this book. Uh, but when she finds that naked uh, dead man in the kitchen and she goes, Stephen, and then the chapter ends, that was like the final straw for me. I said, oh, this is not written well. But that's okay because I've read books that aren't written well and you can still enjoy those. It's like Tyler Perry. This book is a Tyler Perry movie with a uh, casual racism so would i recommend this book no did i enjoy it indeed would i read it again no no there are there are other books out there that do tension well that also does don't give me uh the ethical conundrums that this one did and also uh that gives you a family and children that you actually care about at the beginning (laughs) so no i wouldn't recommend it and i enjoyed it alexis what did you think of The Marsh King's Daughter by Karen Dion? And would you recommend this book? I, you know what? I did not know. I When I first read this book, I was like, I don't know how I feel about it. I don't, I don't know if I, if I like it. I don't know if I don't like it. We didn't even it. mention the Hans Christian Andersen of it all. Yeah, that's, Talk about unnecessary. That was weaved in there. Ooh-wee. That was weaved in there at the beginning of each chapter. They read a section of the um uh, the Marsh King's daughter. I think it in, it concludes it concludes, but still, I didn't really know. And even mm-hmm. the second time going through it, I still don't know how I feel about this book. It leaves me. I do feel. I agree. I think there are some um parts in here that were um exciting that you could go along with and be like anticipating something yeah. but i i just don't mm-hmm. know um <laughs> i suppose it's okay I, I did like learning about the uh <laughs> about the hunting and tracking that was interesting i don't know why it was so hard but i just left not sure of how i felt about this book and i, I thought i would have a better idea by today, um, I'm not sure. So mm-hmm. I will say, I mean, I don't have to read it again. I don't. And I don't even know. You know, I was interested in the movie. I, I don't even think I will watch the movie after having read the book. So. Oh, I'm sure it'll be disgustingly violent. Yes, for sure. I checked the um so. the reason for its rating, and that's what it said that it's, it's yeah, violent. not good. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. yeah, I don't know because she does vividly and describe her um, the hunting experiences. So why do you need this uh, Native American monster to move along your plot when there are so many monsters in your own culture as there are in everyone's culture? You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, Because there's always a danger that you'll bring in someone that's not part of your culture in a way that is stereotypical. And maybe she has like a lot of Native American friends that informed her writing. And maybe she herself is even... You know, a fourth Native American or something. I don't know. Maybe. Uh, But that's never necessary. It's really not. And it's always a crutch that people lean on to make the the monster of the story seem more uh, mysterious and even monstrous because we're afraid of what we don't know and what we don't understand. Well. Such as perhaps other cultures. Well, would that be similar to the, um, the Falling book? (laughs) <laughs> sure, girl. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> Let's not do that. <laughs> Alexis is being messy in her own way. <laughs> All right, then. So you wouldn't recommend it, is what you're saying? Yeah, I can't because I can't even establish how I feel about it. So I can't recommend it. Listen, y'all, we like this book and we never read it again or recommend it. That's fine. <laughs> do with that what you will. Alexis, what are we reading next week? Losing the signal. The un told story behind the extraordinary rise and spectacular fall of Blackberry by Jackie McNish. (laughs) And uh, this is a really engaging 
um, piece of big tech history that we are diving into. The book, however, is under 300 pages. So listeners, we encourage you to read that with us next week and we will see you then. Lit Society is brought to you by Alexis Sanaria and Kari Herrera. Support the cause by leaving a five-star review for our show on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, along with a comment about why you absolutely love us because we love you too. Visit LitSocietyPod.com to sign up for our amazing email newsletter, which is coming back and will be even more amazing than it ever has been and includes giveaways. So if you like free stuff, be sure to visit LitSocietyPod.com and sign up for that email newsletter. And until next time, you guys, read read something. something. Bing, bing, bing.